Josh, Josh Stevens. MZ, Michael Zwirling. Hi, Josh Stevens. How are you today? Be honest. Oh, fantastic. I made my cues right, so uh, we're on a good note. Yeah, so far, yeah, that's true. Um, I'm at uh, World Headquarters uh, and uh, doing the program from here. And um, I may I ask you a personal question? Oh, yeah, you owe a lot, actually. They, they were... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, they were talking on town hall news uh, about the novel coronavirus. Now, um, I haven't heard the novel part in quite some time. And why do they call it novel? Because uh, it's it's novel. It's 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 you know unusual. Well, why do they call? I know why, and it's because they call it that because novel in this case stands for new. So new coronavirus. Oh, okay. News, huh? Yep. I didn't realize that. All right. Well, li listen, it's been quite a long time since uh, I have received a compliment. And uh, you know me. I just love compliments. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. And so I fish for them all the time. I go fishing for compliments quite regularly. And, and today I, I think I'm going to get some because of my choice of of a guest. So without any further ado, let's start the show. Good morning. A brighter day is here. Good morning. May we bring you cheer. We've got time. We've got tunes. We've got time, tunes, and temperature. Get up and go. It's today, you know, on KSCO Radio. Yep, we sure have a guest that is bound to get me compliments. Because I always get compliments whenever I have this guest on the radio. So, um, yep, 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 yep. We're so excited about that. So we hope you'll stay with us right up until uh, 12 noon. Um, we think you'll be happy. To, there's an awful lot to talk about. So let's just do it and start right now. Good morning. Now stay right here on KSCO Radio. John, John Rothman, Indeed. how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to KSEO. It's about time. It's always uh, my pleasure, and may I compliment you, as I always do, on the splendid music, the format. I just enjoy myself whenever I'm with you. I, and, and, and I just love the compliments. I don't know what I would do without compliments. I couldn't live without compliments. I just realized that recently, you know. I, I've lived most of my life with hardly any compliments but when i get them i feel such a rush you know all i can tell you is your mother who adored you complimented you all the time and when i had the opportunity to be with her she had nothing but superlatives to say about you <laughs> that, you know a mother's love you can't go wrong oh wow that's great so how have you been i mean it's been quite a few years and you're you're back on a regular radio gig on KGO. Is it six to eight weeknights? Is that right? I am on uh, from six to nine, six Monday to nine. through Friday, okay. and on Saturday from five until eight. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're a six-day-a-week person, huh? Yes, yeah, six days shall you labor and do all your work, and oh. the seventh day you can take it easy. <laughs> you and I became acquainted what was it in December, uh, on, in, in December, January, uh, 2011, 2012, right. when uh, the the then ownership, and I guess it's still the current ownership, if no, I'm it's, not mistaken. It's, it's, well, it is, but it isn't. It's a, it, they've gone through a lot of changes, but yeah. it's still cumulus. It is. The, they decided that the management back then decided that they could um, that they could save money by booting out all the good talk show. <laughs> I don't know if it was money. I think it was a format change. They wanted to go all news, and they really uh, uh, were. I was very pleased when they decided uh, 
about two years ago to come back uh, to me and ask me to come back to the talk format. I enjoy it. And, of course, uh, on occasion when I was not with uh, KGO, I was able to come down and see your wonderful studios and uh, have an opportunity to uh, do some talk radio with you. Well, it, it was great. I mean, I, I was as upset as anybody was when, when KGO pulled the plug on all the wonderful broadcasters uh, because KGO was the model for my station. And, and, in fact, back in the 60s, when I was a high school kid, I tried to get the then managing partner of KSCO to flip it to talk radio because we all knew that uh, there were going to be changes in because the University of California, Santa Cruz, had just arrived uh, in 1965, and there were going to be a whole lot of changes, a whole lot of things to talk about. But at the time, I couldn't convince him to do I was only, what, 14, 15 years old, but I couldn't get Vernon to uh, even consider flipping to uh, talk radio from uh, Montevani Music uh, for the retirees. Um, but... Uh, uh, was finally able to uh, do it myself, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, and you have, and uh, I'm thrilled. Anyway, well, what would you like to discuss on this well, glorious Saturday morning? Okay, we're, we're having a um, we're, we're ha oh, Joe Lieberman is 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 on the phone here, and who used to know you. you can you remember Joe Lieberman? Everybody the, remembers Joe the former Lieberman. vice presidential candidate. Yes, yes. Oh, good. Can yes. Be, here, let's put Joe. Joe Lieberman on. Joe Lieberman, welcome to KSCO. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, I wanted to say that I heard MZ that you had uh, John Rothman is a very, very wonderful man, and when my son, my uh, beautiful wife, uh, has always appreciated his one. You know, America. America is a tapestry, and I regard you. MZ is part of that tapestry, and John Rothman is a wonderful human, not only in the, the, the political framework, but in the overall human, humanitarian framework. And it's situations like this that make America the great country that it is. And I wanted to tell you, I look forward to hearing your interview with John Rothman, who I regard as a wonderful political observer. He's very objective. He's very fundamentally sound. And I love the fact that you're having him on the program, and Hadassah and I will be listening with glee. You have a good job as both of you, and I'm going to go back to listening to the great Casio. Oh, wow. You, That's Senator. great. A pleasure. I, I, I had no idea that you never know who's in the audience of KSCO. I'm, I'm, we, I, I'm, I'm touched. What can I say? So, John, what a what a uh, election we've been through. I, I you might think it's it's uh, over. Um, uh, what do you think? Do you think the election is over, or do you think? Oh, of course, a... it's settled. Yeah, uh, there's there's no way now that uh, uh, there will be any change. Uh, all the court cases the Trump campaign has brought have been thrown out, save for one. Uh, this morning there was a request that Michigan not certify, but I'm quite sure that is uh, Wayne County, but I'm quite sure they will. Uh, and, of course, you've seen in Georgia where a Republican secretary of state who was a Trump supporter, an early Trump supporter, uh, way back when, uh, has said, nope, the results are in and, and uh, Joe Biden carried Georgia. Uh, I, I, I really think now that the question is how do we uh, come together as a country? How do we deal with the virus? Uh, how do we uh, engage in a smooth transition? And uh, I think that's going to be the key, and I hope we move to that, that point very soon. How can people argue with that? But they might argue with the fact that that it, it might not be over, because here's something. Here's a question. Um, I don't know enough about this, and I'm sure you do. When all the states uh, or, or enough of the states certify that put uh, that officially put Biden over the top, right, Mm -hmm. uh, can't there be lawsuits la later that could overturn nope. that? Or is nope. that that's just Last absolutely chance, impossible? chance for opposition uh, is when, on January 6th, uh, the uh, Senate and House convene in a joint session. During that joint session, uh, there can be challenges. And you may recall that in the year 2001, uh, when Al Gore was presiding at his own defeat, 
there were members of the House who raised objections, and Al Gore ruled them out of order and just proceeded. That's what will happen now. And I know it's tough to lose an election. Believe me, I, I have been on the winning side and the losing side, and it's a lot more fun to be on the winning side. But Okay. okay. Well, well, I'm uh, particularly interested in I, I've been meaning to call you and, uh, you know, see if you would go on with us, because I, I know that you have not been a Trump supporter. Uh, you haven't been someone with what I would call uh, uh, Trump derangement syndrome. Uh, you've been very calm. And, and one of the first questions I want to ask you today, and I'm sure you can answer this better than anybody can, uh, why do pe why do so many people just viscerally hate Donald Trump. Why? You know, first I have to tell you, I don't hate Donald Trump. I, I know, I know, I know. I, I don't I think know, you do. I Excuse I me. I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, you know, given the impression that, that I think you do, because I don't think that at all. I want to be crystal clear. He has particular policy positions. And let me give you some examples. On abortion, on guns, on uh, the Middle East, on uh, the climate change issue, uh, on a whole series of things. And he takes very strong stands, and the people who oppose him oppose him vigorously. There is another aspect, and that is I think there is a feeling by people who oppose Donald Trump that this man has abused the presidency, abused his authority, uh, and uh, the anger that exists. And, and by the way, it's not exclusive to Donald Trump. It was the same anger directed at Barack Obama, the same anger directed at George W. Bush, the same anger directed at Bill Clinton. And when you have a situation in which a country is severely divided, and when you have people who feel passionately, uh, it, uh, it makes it harder for there to be a reconciliation. Uh, and Donald Trump is a divisive figure. He's not a uniter. He's a divider. And he's proud of being a divider because that's how he holds his base. He got 71 million votes, more than any other person who's run for president, except one, Joe Biden. And uh, I will offer one other thought, and that is in this election, I'm not sure people voted for Joe Biden. I think they voted against Donald Trump. I think, I think you're right. I think you're right. I know a lot. I know a, a surprising number of people whom I thought think exactly like I do and would certainly, you, you know, uh, uh, warts and all, uh, look at the big picture and be Trump supporters who I recently found out are not and did not and would not vote for Trump. Yeah, it, and it, that, got, that got me thinking that, geez, I mean, for, for me, I, I look at, I look at the, the, the big picture and my God, I, I can't remember a, a president more supportive of Israel, something that's very important to you and to me. Correct. Um, and, and that alone should get people, should get certain people to say. I think, it, I think the problem Donald Trump had was this virus. He downplayed the virus. He said it was going to disappear. He kept giving dates when everything would be fine, uh, even to the point that prior to the election, he said, oh, on November 4th, day after the election, nobody will be talking about the virus. He misjudged what may be the seminal issue of his presidency. Uh, now, I don't blame Donald Trump for the virus. Not a chance in the world. But there is no doubt that by not wearing a mask, by not social distancing, by going out and campaigning the way he did, uh, ignoring all of the very strictures that his own administration had recommended, uh, he antagonized people. Uh, what I'm hearing from a lot of my Republican friends is a sense of relief. Uh, and uh, I think that was his, his great failure. But there's a reason for it. Donald Trump defied the odds. He ran for president. Nobody thought he could win. He uh, made clear that he would... Uh, take over the Republican Party. Nobody thought he could. He did. He won an election that was very controversial against Hillary Clinton. He didn't win the popular vote, but he won the electoral vote. By the way, the same number of votes that Joe Biden now has. Yeah. And he then became president. And in his four years, and I will do on KGO a retrospective on Donald Trump to explain 
the things that he did that were right, in my judgment, there's on the radio talk shows, than the things he did that I thought were wrong. And the key to Donald Trump is he believed in himself, MC. He believed that he could overcome all odds. Maybe he got that from his father, Fred, who told him that he could overcome and that he would never be a loser. Uh, and I think that is the key to Donald Trump. It's his personality. And we're going to be talking about this for as historians for years and years to come. Well, okay, I, I'm interested in, in that perspective that you brought up about underplaying the virus, and that could have been a major factor that led to his downfall. Um, but uh, I'm, I've talked to an awful lot of people whom I thought were Trump supporters who were not because they could not support such a horrible, divisive man. Uh, and I said, well, but what about his policy? Oh, his policies are great. He's such a horrible person. I couldn't live with myself voting for him. I went wow. through that. MC, wow. I, work, I went through that when I worked for Richard Nixon. Uh, Richard Nixon was a, a very divisive figure, as you know. And he was a man whose policies most people would applaud, uh, particularly when it came to foreign policy. There were differences on Vietnam and Chile and so forth. But Nixon generally received high marks. But when the scandal of Watergate hit, and I talked to people, and I said, well, do you agree with his policies? Why aren't you for him? We just can't. Well, you can't, you can't support a dishonest person in the case of uh, Nixon. And that's although, many although it's amazing that, that at, you know, by the time he passed, and for you know, maybe 10 years before he passed, he, he same, somehow over, overcame that negative, those negative impressions of him. And I somehow agree. people started giving him a pass and started thinking, hey, wow, we've never had such a foreign policy, uh, you know, maven as this person. And he deserves credit for that, even though he, he might have been a crook. <laughs> you mentioned Israel. I want you to know that when you go to Israel, there is a museum there, uh, and uh, it's called Friends of Zion. And it has non-Jews who were friends of Israel. I can assure you that there will be a statue to Donald Trump. Uh, even those who, who are critical of many aspects of what Donald Trump has said will indicate to you he's been great for Israel. There are areas where Donald Trump excelled. And there are people who agreed with his policies among evangelicals. Uh, his popularity because of his position on a woman's right to choose or abortion, the question of the Supreme Court, not just the Supreme Court, not just the three justices he added to the court. He put over 300 justice, uh, judges on the district courts and appellate courts. Uh, he completely changed the face of the American judiciary. For people who believe that was necessary, Donald Trump will always be a hero. So what you have to do and I try to be objective as a presidential historian, is to take the pluses and the minuses, put them together, and then make some determination. Uh, and I think uh, that is what will happen with Donald Trump. As Richard Nixon, uh, well, let me give you a better example. Uh, Harry Truman, when he left office, uh, was at about 52% uh, approval. Uh, yet today he's ranked as one of the near great, if not one of the great presidents. George W. Bush, who also left office with record lows, has said, well, I'm like Harry Truman. I'm going to let history be the judge. And Donald Trump will have to let history be the judge. Uh, when we have this conversation again in 15 or 20 years, MZ, the full dimensions uh, will be available. And one other thing you have to understand, I understand why Donald Trump is fighting so hard for the presidency. He knows that the minute he leaves the presidency, there will be lawsuits galore against him. Cy Vance, the district attorney of New York, is ready to take him to court. And it, these are not federal charges. These are state charges dealing with his finances. And uh, the president uh, can pardon himself, uh, I believe, uh, constitutionally, although you could challenge that. Uh, and he can pardon his family on federal charges. But state charges, he, he can't do a thing. And I can tell you that there is a genuine commitment uh, to, one, getting his tax returns out there, uh, number two, uh, uh, making him pay the price for what many view as a cover-up. Uh, and there is a genuine uh, pursuit of Donald Trump, and that is going to continue uh, into uh, the next uh, several years. 
Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I haven't invited calls yet, but might as well because we already have a call. Wait, may I ask a question real yeah, quick? Yeah, go, go ahead, Josh Stevens. So, John, I always got to ask this because we don't have other radio personalities come on often. Um, and this is a quick sidetrack, but then our callers will bring it back on track. What is the biggest challenge of you entering your broadcast career, like starting and just maintaining it, everything in between? I'm a news junkie. I love the news, and I love talking about the news, and I love talking with people who disagree with me about the news. Uh, and uh, I have definite opinions, but I think when uh, you look at my radio program, I have more Trump supporters come on, uh, and I'm considered a, a more liberal radio talk show host. I put more Trump people on than uh, just about anybody. I want people to hear what the Trump people have to say. I want there to be vigorous argument. I want there to be vigorous discussion. Sometimes on my program, I will do a back and forth, a pro and con, and let them uh, fight it out. That's what makes interesting radio, compelling radio. Uh, it, it's no fun if people simply call and say, I agree with you. And, and you're, a breath of, see... you're a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Truly. Well, I, you got the pipes. Sean Hannity, uh, Rush Limbaugh, uh, uh, Laura Ingram, the others are very entertaining, but there's no dissent there. It, it's, it's one long presentation of their position. It would be much more fun, uh, as uh, was years ago, when you had uh, a, a real debate between personalities. So that, to me, is talk radio. The more vigorous, the better. Now, who can argue with that? Can you, Josh Stevens? <laughs> Certainly not. And uh, that's amazing, though. But, like, what got no. you into the career is what I... Like, how did you first get your start in the radio world? Oh, uh, that's a great, it's a great story. I was standing in my son's preschool talking to a woman I'd never met before who was the executive producer at KGO. Her name is Barbara Lane. She's now the book editor at the San Francisco Chronicle. And she said to me, have you ever thought about uh, doing talk radio? And I said, no. And she said, well... Would you like to fill in? I said, sure, what the heck? And I came in, and I, I filled in, and then I was very lucky because Ray Taliaferro, a blessed memory, uh, took a week off, and they said, would you mind filling in for Ray for a week? And I did, and uh, it was a hit. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, they offered me the overnights on the weekends. Now, in case you're contemplating a uh, career in radio, uh, Jack Swanson, who is our, uh, the man I, I reported to, uh, said to me, John, this is just temporary. And I agreed to work at 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. Saturday, 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Sunday. It was a temporary assignment. He said, we have great plans for you. It took 11 years and 11 months to the day for me to get a full-time job. So, wow. <laughs> It, it, you know, you just it, you enjoy doing it. And let me tell you, if you promise, this is just between us, right, Josh? You're not telling anybody. Oh, you know it. I would pay them to let me come in and do what I do. Because it's I have such fun doing it. And I think my listeners... You know, you know who it. else said that confidentially? And, and I, I don't think I'm talking out of school because he wouldn't mind. He moved to heaven. Dr. Bill. Yep. He, al he also when said Dr. the same thing. Yeah. Now, when Dr. Bill did his national program after we left KGO, uh, I was the one he asked to fill in for him. And I did that. Uh, in fact, I did it on your, your station uh, when, yeah. when you were carrying him. Uh, yeah. So to me, that's the key, Josh. Radio is a great medium. I think people enjoy it. And the whole trick is to enjoy it yourself and to convey that sense of joy. And, uh, and that's it. I, I agree. It's where work doesn't exactly feel like work, and that's an amazing uprising. So basically, you worked those night shifts, you got your foot in the door, and then you expanded as time progressed. Yeah, I was offered the opportunity, and I grabbed it immediately, uh, and I would do it again. Uh, I... John, what had you been doing before? Oh, uh, I was lecturing, uh, traveling the country speaking, written two books, uh, countless articles, uh, uh, giving speeches all over the Bay Area. Many of your listeners know that I would be, well, just about everywhere giving speeches. It was great fun, and I enjoyed it very much. I'll tell you, the, the saddest thing for me in this, uh, this pandemic is that all the places where I used to speak, and, and a lot of them were senior centers, yeah. uh, uh, I've had to stop. Uh, it, it, uh, it's not that I lost income. I mean, I did, but that's not the problem. I miss the people. 
I miss seeing the people. I miss being with the people and uh, having a chance to have them meet me and talk to me directly and my having a chance to meet them. Uh, so uh, that, It should be that way again, don't you think? I'll tell you honestly, MZ, I don't know. We're going to have real issues. First, uh, this virus is mutating. It's a different virus on the East Coast than it is on the West Coast, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the problem of the vaccine. Will the vaccine work? Is it a permanent vaccine? What will happen if 50% of the people refuse the vaccine for, because they're anti-vaxxers uh, or they doubt that the vaccine will work? Uh, I, this is the most peculiar, the most difficult situation. Let me just tell you this. They offered to set equipment up here at my home uh, so that I didn't have to go into the studio. I said, no, it's 10 minutes for me to drive down to the studio. Uh, I don't see anybody. Uh, my engineer is there. My producer is there. But I, they're separated by, uh, by glass. I said, I want to be in the studio. I want to be able to feel that pulse. I want to be able to punch the buttons myself. And um, it makes radio for me more more vibrant and alive. And the only two now who... Uh, at KGO, who go in, or Pat Thurston and myself. Uh, and Pat was broadcasting from home, but she saw what I was doing, and she said, you know, I can do that too. So we, uh, the more presence you can have in a studio, that interaction with people is, is really critical. And what I like about your station is you, you're a family. I mean, uh, this, uh, this is a station which, which MZ has, has grown and developed along with your mother of blessed memory. And it, it's a family affair. I know the people who listen uh, love you and love the station, even if they don't always agree with you. And that's what radio should be. Uh, I believe well, I was once criticized because uh, uh, I was told that listening to John Rothman, it's like a family affair. The same people are calling, the same people are emailing. That's right. That's what it is. It's reaching out a giant hand, in this case a voice, to communicate with people and to have people communicate with you. And uh, that's why we do so well at KGO, and that's why you're doing so well on your station. Josh, that was a great question to ask, Josh. And I had one more aching question, and then we can go to the filled-up phone board. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, what words of advice do you have to up-and-coming broadcasters such like as myself? Josh. Like Josh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take any job you can to get your foot in the door. Uh, whether it's as a producer or whether it's as an engineer, get yourself in so that you can begin that. And understand something. This is not like the old days. There's not big money in, in radio anymore, unless you're a Sean Hannity or a Rush Limbaugh. Wasn't that always the case, John? Really? No. Uh, it's no, always been uh, considered uh, show business, and people will, uh, will work for, you know, reduced wages to be in show business. I know okay. that's always the way it was with well, me. I, I would have worked for free. I've been at KGO uh, since 1996, except for the period when I wasn't. Uh, and uh, some of my colleagues were making uh, six-figure salaries. Uh, it, 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 it just depends, really, uh, on your timing. Uh, and the simple truth is that uh, radio is a permanent fixture but don't go into radio to make money. Go into radio to enjoy yourself. And, and I'll, I'll give you one other quick tip on that. Don't be picky. Uh, get your foot in the door. Have a chance. And uh, you never know where your career is going to go. Uh, that's all I can say. Well said. Yeah, and, and I think it rings true with you already. I, I, you know, it's great to hear John give that answer to a great question. But didn't you know that already, John? I mean, uh, Josh? A lot of those I did, but... Yeah. It's not nice to have it affirmed. <laughs> yes. No, and so, reminders, too. Yeah. These are always important. Yeah. And you understand, uh, I've had people call me in and talk about MZ on KGO, and I always commend him, because MZ and your late mother, God bless her soul, uh, kept radio alive on the peninsula. I mean, you're the one who really kept it going. It's live, it's local, it's uh, interactive, uh, and... Uh, Thank God for you. I wish the kind of station you have existed in every community in the country because you really are a community-based station. And that is what makes what you do, uh, both of you, uh, so special. 
Wow. You, you know, John, we were going to talk about lots of things, but I like this line of conversation so much, particularly because it's fraught with compliments for me. Would you mind continuing for the rest of the show along, <laughs> along this line? So, all right. Well, <laughs> You know, so, what, all right, let's take. Hey, hey, John, would you do a half an hour? <laughs> but I know that a half an hour with MZ is is generally about two hours. Uh, yeah. I'll stay with you. It's okay, not a problem. Great. Okay, let's go back to the phones, or let's go to the phones and take our first caller. I'm going to say take next. So that would be the caller who's been waiting the longest, the smartest caller to K to uh, K KSCO by far. That will be Colonel Terry. Well, MZ, uh, you've got some smart broadcasters yourself, like Doctor and Mrs. Future, and Mrs. and and John. Have have you heard the futures? No, I haven't. I regret to say, but I am now going to have to. Oh no! Yeah. It's well worth your your time on Tuesday from two to four, and uh, their program is on science and reality, and obviously the future. And you'll agree with me, Mrs. Future demonstrates the highest IQ. Uh, of all the uh, talent on KFCO, and her husband <laughs> demonstrates, as I say on the air, the second highest IQ. Uh, great people and, and, a, and a great program, and I think it's worthy of syndication. But do, do treat yourself to Dr. and Mrs. Future on Tuesday afternoons. Uh, also, speaking of treating, and on, or on demand, highly. I've enjoyed. Colonel Terry, know, wait a second, wait a second, I have to interrupt. Go ahead. You don't. You don't have to wait. Nobody has to wait for any particular time that a KSCO program is broadcast, because we podcast everything. We we have a free app called KSCO. Just search your app store. Search your app store, regardless of what smartphone or 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 device you have or computer, and download the KSCO app. And that will, uh, when you run that, you will be able to uh, search our archives. Everything we produce at KSCO is is archived almost immediately, like within the la within an hour after it's broadcast. Well, yeah, John, so, treat yourself to the Doctor Future show, but also treat yourself to calling in and saying something smart, which you will do if you call in on Tuesday. No doubt. And you know, speaking of you being smart, I've I've enjoyed your program. Since I've many years ago, since I started commuting out here from the East Coast, and uh, keep up the good work. Tell us all again what times, dates, and hours are your is your program live? Monday through Friday from six to nine in the evening, and on Saturday from five to eight. So it's okay. six days a week, and uh, it also. You can get the uh, KG, go, go online, it's all archived, and you can hear it any time. Okay, so tonight at 5, you'll be on, sir. I will, absolutely, 100%. Now, listen, now you know, my well-informed perspectives, like yours, uh, mine include, in my idealistic youth working for Ralph Nader, on what became the airbag project, among others, that got us all airbags over the uh, objections of the auto company executives who said it would cost $6,000 a car. It's, it's, the cost is four to 600 and it saved millions of lives. And again, the public interest was put forward by, by Ralph Nader, and I'm proud of having been affiliated with him. Likewise, sir, we have to respect well-informed wisdom like yours and like Dr. and Mrs. Future and like Ralph Nader's in many cases, and implement that in our national policies and impacting our government. I think we've lost respect for informed wisdom, if you agree with me, uh, in both sides. And I, I want to point out Spinoza, the Jewish philosopher from Holland, in 1670 said democracy is the best form of government. And he looked at the Greek example in the Roman Republic and, and, and Holland's experience from 1390 until continuing. And 1670, he wrote, too often, the people of a democracy, although they have the best form of government to respect individual liberties and to protect their private property, far too often they are bamboozled into making as their leaders those who are really the most privately sneaky, conniving, and corrupt. I'm curious if you agree with Spinoza, sir. And, and lastly, Trump's in trouble because of his lies. Uh, look, look, look at the interviews with his sister and his niece and the books they've written about him that are well-informed again. Um, the man has so many, and I voted for him because I wanted immigration enforced. The, and I the thought first, maybe the he first really time will. around, the first time around. The, right, the, in 2016, I voted for him. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, by 2017, I was convinced the man is a national security risk of great proportion. And I, I, I don't say things I don't have evidence for. And I did work in the White House, and I did work in counterintelligence. And I, I know the Russians targeted him as someone to corrupt and who was corruptible 30 years ago. But I voted for him in 2016. Obviously, I did not vote for him in 2017. I'm not happy with the Democratic position. It's ridiculous and preposterous on immigration and sanctuary state. However, we are in a serious situation here, if you'd agree. I'll, I'll welcome your comments, sir. Yeah, I, listen, I agree with you on Spinoza, and that's my problem with Donald Trump. I always believed he was a charlatan and a fake and, frankly, fundamentally dishonest. I still believe that. Uh, the fact that he has served as president and has done some things with which I agree, uh, that's fine. But we have to move on. He has to concede the election. We have to hope that Republicans and Democrats can come together in Washington uh, to produce a bill, a bailout bill, because the American people are desperate for that. And I realize that Joe Biden is not perfect. Uh, no president is. But Joe Biden should be given a good, solid shot. He's a man who has vast experience. I have had the privilege of knowing him for many years. And uh, I, I believe that he's going to give it his best shot. And for those of us who know Kamala Harris, uh, and I was the, she, the first radio program she ever appeared upon was mine. <clears throat> and uh, she's going to have a very tough time as vice president uh, making all of the things she wants to do happen as well. But, you know, that's that's what we have. We have a leadership that's going to work. Let me also just throw out, Colonel, that uh, the most interesting thing for me is what the Republican Party will do. Uh, I was a Republican for many, many years. I worked for Richard Nixon. If you read uh, Richard Norton Smith's biography of Thomas E. Dewey, he calls me a scholar of modern republicanism. In uh, Stanley Hilton's book on uh, on Bob Dole, the same thing, uh, that I'm the leading scholar on the Republican Party. I want the Republican Party to rebuild. And as John Boehner observed, uh, the Republican Party is no longer the Republican Party. It's the party of Donald Trump. No political party should be the party of a single individual. It needs to be a party that collectively has a platform with which you can agree or disagree. The most disturbing thing to me about this election, if you want to know the truth, is there was no Republican platform this year. The Republican Party leadership said, whatever Donald Trump wants, that's not the way to run a political party. It cannot be the party of Trump. The Republican Party has to return or grow into a political party that's truly viable. It can be a conservative party if, it, if that's the desire, but it has to be a party that reflects a political party and not a single person. John, what made you flip from Republican to Democrat and when? I flipped in 1973. I flipped when Sam Yorty, who was the mayor of Los Angeles and who was a Democrat, became a Republican. There wasn't room for me and Sam Yorty in the same political party. Uh, and also, you have to realize, MZ, I am pro-choice. I favor the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, I believe very strongly in progressive republicanism. I'm the, the biographer of Harold E. Stassen, uh, who was one of the leading progressive Republicans. And in David Levering Lewis's new book on, on Wendell Wilkie, the improbable uh, Wendell Wilkie, I'm acknowledged as a scholar of, uh, of Harold Stassen and, and of the Republican Party. Uh, I was a progressive Republican. Yeah, those of you who are Californians will remember uh, Earl Warren and Goodwin Knight and George Christopher, who was mayor of San Francisco. And yes, Richard Nixon, uh, who was a progressive Republican, who called himself a liberal Republican uh, over many years. So that's the kind of Republican I was. But there was no room in the Republican Party uh, for somebody like me. I always remember Jerry Ford and Betty Ford at the 2004 Republican National Convention and uh, they looked at each other and said, you know, we're the only uh, pro-choice Republicans in this convention hall. And that's the ultimate tragedy, because the Republican Party used to be a big tent party, as did the Democrats, by the way. Remember, the Democrats were a coalition of northern liberals and southern Democrats, segregationist Democrats. They were a coalition. The Republican Party included, uh, at, when I was active in the Republican Party, uh, it included a Barry Goldwater, a Nelson Rockefeller, a George Romney, a Bill Scranton. A Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., a Richard Nixon, a Harold Stassen. It included a range of people. And unfortunately, uh, uh, both political parties have lost it. Let me just conclude by saying um, when a bird flies, it has two wings. The political parties in this country worked because they had two wings. The minute a political party has one wing, it, it doesn't work anymore. And that's the problem with getting Republicans and Democrats together. In the old days, 
liberal Republicans in the Senate could get together with liberal Democrats, and conservative Republicans in the Senate could get together with conservative Democrats, and they were able to forge something. We don't have do, that ability. Do you see to any trend in your uh, in the, uh, that might cause you in the future to flip back? No. Okay. All right. Not as long. Not as long as the Republican Party is anti-choice, uh, believes that the global warming is a hoax. Uh, that I mean, th th there are certain issues which I think transcend political parties. Do you know who the political party was who first promoted the Equal Rights Amendment? The uh, Republican Party. Yeah. Forty. Wendell Wilkie. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the Republican Party has just come a long way from where I was, uh, although I would still, if you really asked me, bottom line, uh, what I still am, I, I still view myself as a, a liberal or progressive Republican in, in the sense that I was... And a, doesn't it disturb you that so many of the Democrats these days seem to be uh, moving toward against free speech? I don't think they're against free speech, but what you don't have in the Democratic Party anymore is a Henry Jackson or a Pat Moynihan, uh, uh, where you had articulate uh, Democrats who were certainly uh, certainly progressive in, in their social views, but had real views that uh, aren't reflected in the Democratic Party anymore. Joe Biden is a relic of those days. And the question for Joe Biden as president will be whether or not he can control the forces in the Democratic Party that would like him to move very far to the left. Uh, and uh, I think I think he'll withstand those pressures. I really do, and I hope he does. And I hope the Democratic Party rethinks uh, its approach. Uh, the two-party system in this country only works if uh, there are wings of the parties and competitive forces within a party. Hey, MZ, you, got, you guys are old enough. You remember when there were platform fights at conventions. Uh, yeah. And we the, don't the have conventions. I don't even know why they have conventions anymore, frankly. Yeah, you're right. The, yeah. You know, it's funny. Before the pandemic, uh, KGO said, do you want to go and cover the conventions? And I looked into them. I said, what for? What, what do you think is going to happen to the convention? you think there's going to be a floor fight at either the Democratic or Republican conventions? I can sit in the studio and get the same information. In the old days, when you went to a convention, and uh, let me just give you a quick example. In 1964... At the Republican National Convention, there was a showdown between the liberal Republicans and the conservative Republicans. Yeah, uh, that was uh, Barry Goldwater, right? So. Yep, and that was at the Cow Palace. I attended every session. I had a great time. And it was a struggle for control of a political party. Or if you want to go to 68 at the Democratic Convention uh, and the Vietnam, I have a, a full recording of the entire debate that took place over the Vietnam plank at the Democratic Convention. There was a real battle over an issue. And people argue passionately. Uh, well, that to me is what politics is all about. And we don't have that in our political parties today because the conventions have turned into uh, uh, show places and not uh, real substantive conventions. Do you know the last time we had a multi-ballot convention uh, nominating a candidate for president? The Democrats in 1952, Adlai Stevenson. Wow, I was only one. Yeah, and look how well you age. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the phone lines. Uh, ben in Santa Cruz, uh, welcome to KSCO with John Rothman and poor old MZ. Hey, first I want to give a shout out to old Colonel Terry. I like to refer to him as Colonel Colonel Sanders Terry, the only living Colonel of the Chicken Fried Chicken Foundation. But uh, for John, now that's uncomplimentary, isn't it, Ben? <laughs> Colonel Terry's crazy. He's a dig bat. But, okay. Uh, so you you are a neoliberal. You're like an apologist for the left. Who are you? You're, you're talking to John, right? John, yes. I've never been an apologist for the left. As a matter of fact, if you listen to my show, you'll know how critical I am of that wing of the Democratic Party. I have no problem being critical of them. Uh, I am also, when there are Republicans who I agree with, I'm happy to uh, include them. I'm not a, a, a liberal or a conservative when it comes to those issues. But there are issues on which I feel that I would tend, in, in your view, to end up on the more liberal side. You're correct. That's what I thought. I could tell in your tone. But also, um, your past, you, you talk about Trump in the past tense. Trump hasn't lost the election yet. Oh, yeah. Finding all kinds of fraud. Sure and he has. He's lost. 
He, he may not want to concede it, but he's <laughs> like lost. That, that's the well, let me explain something to you. He has, he has 306 electoral votes, which was precisely uh, uh, what uh, uh, Biden uh, has. 306, yeah. which is exactly what Donald Trump had four years ago. I had no problem in addressing Donald Trump right after the election as president-elect. You're going to see a margin in this campaign of between six and seven million popular votes in which Biden defeats Trump. Of course, of course, Biden won. And it's silly to dispute it. And that's why the courts, uh, some of the conservative justices on the court are throwing out these. You, these you know how lawsuits. you know how 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 so many people for so many years have said everything is made in China these days. It's hard, It's almost impossible to get something that isn't made in China. I've heard a very, very okay. bril brilliant person say, hold on, Ben, hold on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want to know what, what uh, I want to see how John responds to this. I've heard a very, very, very brilliant person refer to uh, Joe Biden as the first uh, uh, American president made in China. How do you That's respond right. to that? Rubbish. You Nonsense. You could say then that Donald Trump was the first uh, Republican president made in Russia. I mean, it's just, it's just silly. It's rhetorical nothing. Both of these men are competitive in the United States of America, campaigned for their party's nominations, won their party's nominations, and uh, that's it. Okay, here's the other thing that bothers me. The other thing that bothers me about people like yourself, when you try to have just a casual conversation, you start stepping up the tempo and the vol you know, your volume. It's, it's like you, you don't want to hear somebody's opinion. And the truth is, the truth is, he heard my opinion. He heard my question, <laughs> and he's hearing yours. Why you don't you step up your Ben? Oh, ben, upset. step up your <laughs> volume. You obviously yeah, don't I listen to my program. Of, yeah, I try to keep it civil, but uh, the, what about the whole Russia collusion thing with Trump? It's been proven to be funded and financed by Hillary Clinton, and then you get into the Dominion software. And the Dominion voting systems that okay. are First of all, if you know, Dominion put out a statement yesterday denying everything, and I've seen nothing that indicates Dominion had any role. It's the same old argument they used on DeBolt. You remember DeBolt no. and the question of how we. Oh, did the, the hanging chads? Yeah, that, that, come on, okay. give me a break. But I, I will say to you, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it's silly. It's nonsense. And the it's silly that you guys don't want to talk about it. It's silly that you make it silly. That's what's so silly. It's making people like me not trust anybody. That's okay. why I'm... I'm Do you trust the courts? The courts huh? have thrown out 30 direct challenges that the Trump organization has raised. Now, Rudy Giuliani was America's mayor, and a great man, okay, by the way. Mean? And if you watched Rudy Giuliani uh, in his press conference the other day, I, I almost cried. I was so saddened to see this man who had such greatness and who could not substantiate a single, single charge. Do you listen to Tucker Carlson? Tucker there Carlson asked that. the Trump people, show me the evidence. There's no evidence. None. He left. Uh, okay, no, he didn't leave. I put him on hold because I don't like people talking over each other. Yeah, I ducked him program. as well. I pulled a okay. cumulus. Uh, uh, so, Ben, anyhow, uh, thank you for calling 479-1080. Okay, thanks, Mike. Have a good one. Thank you very care. much, Ben. It's a pleasure. Yeah. See you at KGO. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Arthur and Prunedale, you're on with John Rothman and MZ. Yes, MZ, thank you for taking my call this morning. I always look forward to Saturday at 10 o'clock to listen regularly to your Saturday Great. Special, I'm happy so. somebody does. <laughs> yes, I, I think a lot of people do. I don't know how many are continuing to listen this morning, however... <laughs> I find. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a second. You be nice, no, Arthur. No, I am being Don't nice. Don't be rude. Mr. Rothman, Mr. Rothman is a longtime KGO style talk show host, has a fabulous tonality to his voice. Politically, everything he said negatively about our great President Trump is the mainstream media dialogue talking points. Even this last one about Tucker Carlson and there is no evidence. Do you, does anyone believe Rudy Giuliani and his staff are going to put their cards on the table and show everyone the evidence before they go to the final courts, the highest courts they're able to go to, to, if nothing else, to show the fraud that is constantly committed by the Democrat Party 
and to the say the Democratic Party, that, sir, and, the Democratic Party. It's the Democratic yes. Party. Be precise. It's, Not Democrat. Democratic. Go ahead. Okay, wait, wait a second, uh, John. Uh, this is a little pet peeve that I have. I thought they were the Democrat. Why are they Democratic? No, no, sir. Explain that I to invite me. you to look at the incorporation papers of the Democratic Party. It is the Democratic Party. That's their formal name. Okay. Like the Republican Party is formally incorporated as the Republican Party. And uh, I will give Sean Hannity credit when he would credit to do. He calls it the Democratic Party because that's what the name is. Okay, thank you, John. I wouldn't. I don't want to belab- belabor that issue. I will check that out. So thank you. However, many of your points this afternoon about President Trump's policies, which you started off with at the beginning of your presentation, were the complete left-wing agenda, making a bigger deal than necessary out of climate change, gun control. I'm surprised you didn't bring up baby killing at at uh, birth, and so on and so forth. Well, obviously, Donald we Trump disagree. Was a- you have a perfect right, sir, to your position. It's why you and I don't agree. It's not a liberal talking point. It's what I happen to believe personally. Nobody tells me what to say. I have no talking points. I'm John Rothman. I can say what I damn well please, and I do. I'm not trying to stop you from speaking like so many of the Democratic people do, especially on college campuses, when someone comes with an opposing position, they go out of their way to protest. John, Arthur is so correct on that. I'm dying to hear your response. Oh, I'm in favor of free speech on campuses completely. I'm opposed to any censorship. I would remind you I'm the person who had David Duke on his program for one hour, uh, and we had a civilized conversation. When when was that? When was that? Oh, I don't know, ten years ago. Uh, would would I, you have him on today? Of course. Really? I don't ban Boy, anybody. You... I don't ban anybody from my program, uh, even when I disagree with them uh, profoundly. Uh, a guy, uh, a guy in Santa Cruz who owned a, um, a Chinese restaurant, very, very popular Chinese restaurant, probably the most popular Chinese restaurant on the West Coast. It was world famous. I even took the smartest man in the world, uh, not <laughs> Colonel Terry, but uh, Bill uh, Doc, Dr. Bill there and he said it was the best Chinese food he's ever eaten the owner of that restaurant a few years ago it was discovered that he had made a five I think it was a five hundred dollar contribution to the Duke for uh, uh, some political office campaign and as a result his workers refused to show up for work and as a result of that he made the decision that day to close down the best Chinese restaurant that anybody who'd ever tried it, uh, and they all well, agreed. I, I don't, I don't want to reveal my secrets for my own show tonight, but yeah. assuming news permits, I'm going to talk about Dr. Atlas. A resolution was passed by the Stanford faculty uh, condemning Dr. Atlas for his views. I think Dr. Atlas's views are completely wrong. But I would never want to see him fired because of his views. Uh, He has a perfect right to express them. I'm somebody who believes in free speech, and that includes. I I think that's great, and I believe that. But but do you would you really reach out for David Duke and have and invite him to be a guest on your KGO? Well, I have. It's been done. No, 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 no. Now, today, these are different. These are different times. I've got a lot of balls when it comes to being a, a. you know, doing things that nobody else does in radio. I do. I'm very and I don't I don't have I wouldn't have the balls to do that because I think I think I think my, my station would be bombed within minutes. I've do never you, had do, that fear and I, I believe and people who listen to my program know I have every point of view on. I want different points of view. Yeah, I, I do too. That's what, that's what KSCO is all about. But uh, you know, I, I'm just not <laughs> do you don't you, you're not you're not you don't have any kind of personal no, fear. Well, you. Uh, you know, I use David Duke, but I've had Pat Buchanan on. Uh, I have had uh, uh, George McGovern on. Uh, I have had people who are left wing and right wing. I, I, you know, I have limited time. I have three hours a day. Sure. I try to make KSCO sure I- overnight temperatures down to the lower 40s, keeping it sunny this weekend and mostly cloudy overnight. Time now for hour two of the Saturday special. This is KSCO. Oh, hello, darling. I hate to hang up on you, but I'm sorry, baby, but I have to go. It's time for that wonderful record show. I'd love to visit, but you'll have to call back. KSCO has the inside track. All right, 
right, uh, welcome to hour number two of the KSCO Saturday special on your favorite radio station. Stay with us until noon. We think you'll be happy you did. I'm sorry, baby, but I really gotta go to KSCO Radio. Bye. And our special guest today is John Rothman uh, from uh, KGO Radio and uh, many other um, uh, um, uh, famous, uh, worthwhile uh, uh, groups. And ah, help me out, John. No, you're doing just fine, MZ. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then, then, then let's go to Karina in Pacific Grove, who's a Donald J. Trump supporter. Hey, Karina, you're on with John and MZ. Hey, Karina, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Go ahead, you're on. Okay, I'll turn up the volume on my phone. Anyway, I wanted to say it's an honor to speak with you, John. I've heard you on uh, Post to Post multiple Spe- times. Speak, speak, most, speak more into the microphone. Or now turn you off sound, speaker. Because yeah, okay, now you sound better? sort of muffled. Yeah, go ahead. That's better? Okay. Um, anyway, John, it's nice to be able to talk to you. I've heard you on Post to Post many times and i can't believe i'm getting to talk to you you're on coast to coast Uh, karina i'm honored to be with you oh are you on coast to coast john i didn't know that oh i've been everywhere oh for gosh sakes Uh, okay go ahead karina didn't mean to interrupt no problem so um i am um a native of california i'm 72 years old and um i was a democrat and then when things started changing, um, you know, and I started learning about Donald Trump running for president, at first I laughed about it. But then the more information I got, um, I started, you know, going, well, let me, let me pay attention to this for a while. And that's when I decided that I wanted to vote for him. And that was in 2016. So I became a Republican not that I'm a Republican, but that was my only way to vote for him in the primary. Right. So since then, I've been really involved. I listen to hours and hours of things on the radio and, um, you know, online uh, every day. And um, I wrote down a bunch of things I wanted to say. I think I want to start with, um, I think that, I mean, one of the things that I can share being a Trump supporter is that when you meet someone that's a Trump supporter, there's this thing that happens. It's like a spiritual connection. And I believe, and I've noticed this for decades, that as things were building up towards where we're now, we are now, that I would always say it's a spiritual problem, you know, just looking at all the things that were going on in the world. And now, you know, here we are. It's just like this... Um, you know, this apex, and people are are choosing sides. And I don't think it's they're choosing it because of a certain issue. Um, I think it's an honest, honest, real perspective. And so I think that that is what's going on, is that people have different perspectives. And it's not about choosing this or choosing that for a specific reason. And there's a lot of reasons why um, I know that a lot of people have chosen um, to be a Trump supporter. Number one, for years and years, people have not trusted the government. And so he came in, you know, not being someone from government, and that was refreshing. And um, we also have, through him, a voice, which it becomes a very personal connection, even though we haven't met him personally. But it's an an inside connection. And I just feel that um, that's moved a lot of people, not just in in our country, but, you know, there's a movement going on in the world. And it's not just here, and it's not just Trump. Karina, you heard heard John say at the beginning of the program uh, that the, the election is over. And there's essentially no way that uh, that Trump will not have to leave the White House before a second. Right. 
I, I, okay, I now, do you, do, you, do you agree with that or you disagree with that? Um, I would say that I disagree with that. I'm okay, so you think there's still a chance. Yet. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I hate to do this, but we have so many calls, I want to get to all of them, okay? So presumably yeah. you've, you've, made your, you've made your point. Uh, and thank you for calling, 479-1080. Here's Rich in San Francisco. Uh, hey, uh, it's, I think it's the Rich that I know. Uh, yeah. 415. Five, the, the 415 both. Media. Yeah. Be careful. Be careful. Uh, careers could be on the line for plug that. Look, I just, uh, let me say a few things. Uh, and I'll, I'll be, because you got a full board, and let's, let's get on with it, as they say. Uh, I like John, and I like you for having him on. This is a wonderful free-form radio. This is what talk radio and free-form radio should be, and not just because I like the, the guest. He is, it, to me, this is, like, this is like a PBS interview on a Sunday where it's pouring rain, and I'm about to have spaghetti and meatballs and Frank Sinatra in the background only. MZ, you're the... Uh, you're the opener, and, uh, and uh, John is, is Sinatra singing my way. It's a great, great <laughs> form of radio that we need more of, and uh, KGO has begun to to go there because they have, they have, in my opinion, they've done a lot of great things. Some things I disagree with, but uh, they've done some really good things. And today is a great chance to listen to a really again a lot of things, a lot of things that I don't even agree with, but I like listening to John. Quickly, if I give my two cents on Trump, because this is something I think I'd like to hear some of your callers and John maybe comment on. If, if Trump had did two things, he'd be sitting in right now as, <clears throat> as President Donald Trump from another term. And he just faked it and said, you know what, we have this, uh, like he told Burns, uh, uh, Bob Woodward. We're going to deal with this. I'm going to wear a mask. And the American people need leadership. When there is crisis and crises, they want a president to lead, even if he fakes it. Had Trump done that for a guy who says he's as smart as he is, he'd be sitting in the Oval Office and waiting to be inaugurated again. And we'd be on this. Well, not only would he be a, would he have re, been reelected, we would probably be past this. We would have worn our mask, and this this uh, this virus, if not totally conquered, at least would have been under control. And again, had he done that, he probably would have won. Re not probably, he would have been reelected. I didn't vote for just personally. I didn't vote for Joe Biden because I think Joe Biden is great. I voted for Joe Biden because he's not Donald J. Trump. And I think if you look around, yeah, he got 73 million votes. He could have been a force. And again, for a guy who says that he's never lost anything, that he's great, that he, that he led the country. You know, when George W. Bush, on September 16th, he went down to Lower Manhattan, MZ. Yeah. And he said with that bullhorn, I, I didn't vote for George W. Bush. And guess what? He wasn't my president i thought al gore won but guess what on that day george w bush president george w bush you know what i became he became my president and had trump learned from that and led the country the country was desperate is desperate for leadership that he would have won re-election and joe biden would have gone back to wilmington delaware but he's now president-elect I'll leave you with that. You guys have a great show. MZ did a hell of a job. And, John, thanks for keeping up the fight. All I nice did was call here. John and invite him on, and he said yes. So that's all there I you did. Go. <laughs> I know. Thanks, I Rich. Never, I appreciate it. I never to say no to MZ. <laughs> hey, here's Margaret in Santa Cruz. John makes me and it doesn't say, uh, you know, it ran out. What, what else? What are you going to say, Margaret? Good morning. Uh, John makes me so curious. Hi, John. Hi, Margaret. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Why didn't your mother abort you? Uh, oh, I understand. You want to go back to the abortion issue. I believe that the question is a question of choice. Uh, and I will... No, 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 no. I will, Why I will didn't you. your mother abort you? 
I will tell you, because she wanted to have children, and she wanted to have uh, the baby that I, I was. But I can tell you a quick story, Margaret. I was the head resident of my college dormitory at Whittier, Whittier College, Murphy Hall, and uh, it was a men's dorm, it was a women's annex. And Wait a minute, Margaret, 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 you've asked John a question. He's trying to answer you. Okay, uh, next caller. I'm not going to allow that kind of... Okay, let me, let me I just help finish the story. Yeah, sure. I went into the women's section, and, and I heard groaning. There was a woman, a young woman, lying on the bed. She'd had a, a botched abortion. She was bleeding. I put her in my car, got her down to uh, Presbyterian Hospital in Whittier, and if I'd been five minutes later, she would have died. I have been pro-choice because that young woman should never have had to go to a butcher. She should have been able to go to a local doctor. And uh, that that's my motivation. I don't want to see those backdoor ador- abortion clinics operating in that way. Uh, it was horrific. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, next caller is going to be uh, Margaret. Not the same Margaret, a different Margaret. This one in Aptos. Go ahead, Margaret in Aptos. You're on with John Rothman and MZ. Margaret in Aptos. Are you going talking once. to me? Yes, I am. You're on. You're on. You're my on. Name, my we... name is Barbara. <laughs> You're Oops. kidding. You know, yes. Josh, Josh. No, I'm this not is a... kidding. My name is Barbara. <laughs> no, no. We believe you know your name. But anyhow, never mind. <laughs> Josh okay. has changed I'm... the Margaret to Barbara in the in the screen. Okay. So. <laughs> Barbara, delighted um, yes. to have you on. Go ahead. How nice of you, John. And it, it's nice to hear your voice and how how kind of you to be a guest um, when you're a busy man. It's always One my question. pleasure. When MZ says jump, I generally ask how high. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> well, that God. might be one of the God, things I'm... that I'm <laughs> asking about. Uh, one thing is I used to watch or listen to KGO all the time when I was a lot younger. I am 75 years old. And I... Um, I just miss the old KGO. Um, And because it's Thanksgiving, (laughs) I just loved the cooking. The two men that were on the cooking talk show and um, who, what was their names? Do you remember, John? Uh, We've had several ones, but it was Gene Burns whose talk show. Oh, I love Gene Burns. Even before Gene Burns. But anyhow, they were telling how to make a turkey, and they were uh, telling when to take the oven on, when to take it off, when to turn it it down. Was it Chef Mark Vogel? Because, Mark, we have him on periodically, and he does the uh, deep-fried turkey uh, program, and it's always great. No, 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 no. It's years past that, or before that. Okay, okay. Anywho, uh, so my father is a cattle rancher in the the mid-California, and uh, he always listened to the the, uh, cooking show, as did I. And he came, at that time I was living in Cupertino, and he came with my mom, et cetera, for Thanksgiving dinner. And I followed the directions, and he would go by the oven and turn it off and then turn it back on. So I had no idea how many times the changed temperature of that turkey was. But it was the best turkey we ever had. (laughs) (laughs) But anyhow, I missed Ron Owens that much. I miss, uh, I loved Armstrong and Getty just recently. Armstrong and Getty can be heard on KSFO. Uh, they're no longer I on I know, KGO. but why not KGO? And you know, radio... I, I think your radio... Excuse me, I just want to finish my point. Yeah, yeah. Your radio station was something that liberals, <laughs> moderates, conservatives, all of us could listen to. But now it is just so pro-liberal. And uh, there's a few of your cohorts that I just have to turn the, the radio off. Well, Barbara, Barbara, you seem to have somehow discovered us, KSCO. Yes. Do you like or do you like us or you no like us? Well, that is depends on who who is on at the time. But what I would like to say is that you do cover a lot of bases, and I enjoy that because 
it, it's your station seems to hit everybody how their viewpoints are, et cetera. And um, I really appreciate that. And KGO used to be that way. How they did you discover? How did you discover us, Barbara? Well, I moved here um, about ten years ago. And I, um, I would say I am a moderate Republican, and I was a little concerned about moving in this area because of the strong liberal force uh, in downtown, especially Santa Cruz, et cetera. Um, I felt that maybe there wasn't a place for me. And when someone told me to start listening to your radio show, and so I did, and I realized that... Uh, you do cover a lot of moderation, and I, uh, although he loves to talk, <laughs> as most talk shows do, most do um, uh, I enjoyed Charlie. I get a big cheer out of him. Okay, and great. I like that well, he. Th this is great. I just wanted to find out that question. Anyhow, thank you for calling four seven nine ten eighty. And real quickly, Here, if I yeah, may, um, thanks, Mike. Real quickly, so let me make a quick interpretation of that. Now, the reason why Barbara expressed that concern of partisan leaning is because if you look at KGO versus KSFO, they're both cumulus-owned, and KGO obviously has become more left-leaning as of late, but you go to KSFO, for example, they carry the syndicated program at night, Red Eye Radio. So that leads me to believe they are two different talk station formats, and one leans a little to the left, one leans a little to the right to get yeah, that, everyone that was on each a brilliant, side. That was a brilliant idea, I believe, of Mickey Luckoff's, uh, you know, many, many years ago, probably over 20 years ago. 20 You're correct. Years ago. Yeah. And so uh, he's got the bases covered, and then, uh, um, and every time they had an ownership change, uh, Mickey was concerned that he would be stepped on, but he wasn't stepped on until Cumulus came. Actually, actually, it's Citadel right before Cumulus. It was I, Citadel, actually. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. He left under Citadel, not under Cumulus. Yeah, and he, and my understanding, he was not asked to leave. He couldn't stand working for them, so he left. You'd have to ask Mickey the yeah. questions, but. Radio changes, ownership changes, uh, radio talk show hosts change. Nothing is static in our business. Yeah. So anyhow, here, go ahead, Steve Lightfoot. Now, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, we're, we're one of the state, one of probably the only stations that uh, has Steve Lightfoot on as a regular call. He's actually been a fill-in guest, uh, uh, guest host. Um, and Steve is the guy who um, says... John that, Lennon, uh, I'm yeah, well familiar, and he will tell you I generally let him speak uh, a little bit anyway. But well, here he is. Anyone. Go ahead. Thanks, Mike. Hi, John. Hi. Yeah, way back when Ron was in his heyday, he gave out a survey for the public to respond to. If you think Steve White was to be a guest of our show, call in. And so many people responded, the lines broke. So I cannot blame the public for, for not wanting to know. But the job of talk radio is to jail Stephen King for killing John Lennon. If that's not the job of talk radio, what is? And don't be so insincere when you tell your audiences how grateful you are that I called, because you're never grateful that I call. What about me? Am I grateful that you call? i got to give you credit, Mike. Uh, you have saved uh, your your uh, ethnicity or whatever you want to call it from shame. You are the redeeming Jew in an otherwise all Jewish censorship operation with Lennon's murder, and I appreciate that, Mike. You're a good okay. man. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Steve. Uh, next caller is Judy in Live Oak. Judy. She got put on hold. Yeah, she and that's because... I know. I could... I could see, she... She wasn't People. ready, and I think she said a sweary no-no. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so let that be a lesson to all of you, even if you've waited an hour. Don't put the phone down and don't uh, listen to the radio because then you're going to be dumped. Like, like the, Anyhow, our next caller is going to be... Hmm, we do... I'll just take next. Let the computer decide. Fr uh, Frank in San Jose about voting machines. Frank, you're on. Hi. Uh, you know what? It's uh, really good to hear 
you and John Rothman, who are on opposite spectrums politically, being respectful, having a nice conversation. You disagree, but you're not disagreeable. I think that uh, we need more of this, you know? We need to bring the temperature down. Okay, so about the voting machine, during your commercial break at 11, I did a five-minute Google search. And um, there, uh, there's a documentary, PBS Hacking Democracy 2006. Excellent. Uh, probably a lot of people saw that. But uh, there, there is a very good reason for the, the, the paper ballots, and that's COVID-19. And also it's well known that all of these voting machines, Sequoia, Diebold, had problems. There was a lawsuit in California, and I, I recommend to anyone just do a quick Google search and look at middle-of-the-road sources like Wikipedia, PBS, and in that way, we, we can get past his name calling and, and, and all of this heat, I think. That's great. And, and John has, uh, has ladled on the compliments to me, and I don't think I've given him a single compliment, so I'm going to right now. The guy's pure class always has been, always will be. And Thank you. I, I, I think it's really, I think it's terrific. Uh, th- this is what talk radio should be, people who disagree without being disagreeable. So. And or agreeing to disagree uh, and uh, agreeably, <laughs> uh, yeah, and respectfully. So <laughs> agreeably, right? So anyhow, uh, thank you very much, um, caller. Let's go to our next. Uh, well, wait a minute. He he. Frank got put on hold again. Uh, were you finished, Frank? Yeah, pretty much. I just want to recommend that documentary, though, Hacking Democracy, PBS, two thousand. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you for calling four seven nine ten eighty. Here's Don in Salinas. A novel president. A novel, yes. Well, uh, first let me say, John Rothman has enough confidence in his own abilities. He will allow opposing views to come on his show. So if you're, if you're thinking of calling into his show and you support Trump or something, go ahead. He will fight you. He'll go toe-to-toe with you. I can say that because he's done it with me a few <laughs> Absolutely, times. Absolutely, <laughs> Don. And Don is a regular caller, and I always enjoy him. Even though we disagree, he's articulate, he's clear, and he has a point of view. He's, he's amazing. He's an amazing caller. But now that I'm hearing that no. he's a regular caller to your show, Don, please forgive me for asking you this question, but what do you do yeah. for a living? Are you retired? Or I mean, uh, do you can you... <laughs> You do all all day, listen to talk radio all day and all night, and do nothing else. No, I'm a salesman, and but I've gotten high centered with this Corona business, so it sidelined me for a while. I see. Okay. So I so I have a lot of that. time on my hands. <laughs> right. Now, uh, here now, here's my broadside with the novel president. You remember, MZ, you were asking why Corona was called a novel virus, yeah. and Josh told you because it's new. Well. Trump is a novel president. He has new ways of handling things, and his ways have produced more peace since Gerald Ford. His ways have lowered our stand, our cost of living, raised our standard of living, brought peace to the Middle East, uh, got us to actually fight with China for the first time since Nixon, but his novel ways have so incensed the left, and the rhinos, that they've embarked on a slash-and-burn strategy on his presidency to the, f- to the point where uh, we have Joe Biden, who's the, the, uh, the polar opposite of Trump. He will raise our taxes, lower our standard of living, raise our cost of living. I haven't heard him say bring- low, lower the standard of living, but I have heard him say we're definitely going to raise taxes if you elect me. I have heard of Oh, yeah, well, well, well uh, okay, when you can't get a decent car to drive because of gas standards, when you can't afford gas to go to your job, that's lowering your standard of living. He's also going to bring us back into foreign entanglement, back into the yeah, endless I, war. Yeah, I meant to ask John about that. I mean, isn't it nice, John, that finally, for the first time in, in my memory, there's, there's relative uh, calm in, in, the, in the Middle East? Uh, you know, there isn't. Uh, I think that's a myth. 
Uh, and I think what's going to happen now with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, I'll make a prediction to you, the Taliban will take over Afghanistan 100%. Now, uh-huh. that may be the, the view of people who want to withdraw, and that's fine. But understand that the uh, Taliban is our enemy. And Mike Pompeo, our Secretary of State, is meeting with him today. Uh, they keep They never kept their word on anything. So that's a problem. In Iraq... There is no country of Iraq anymore. It's completely disintegrated. And if we pull out whatever Mm -hmm. passes for a government there is going to collapse, and we are going to have to deal with the question of Iran, which is now back in the nuclear business. And that really worries me. Uh, Well, as you know, I I, I opposed the nuclear deal. I thought it was a mistake, uh, which uh, Obama uh, pushed through. But I think Donald Trump's withdrawal from the nuclear deal created a tremendous problem, and we're seeing that now. Uh, These foreign policy issues, rather than being quiet, are growing every single day, and we're going to feel the impact very soon. Well, can I I say something on that part? Go ahead, Don. Uh, let's, Let's take Iran. The New York Times ran a lying article that Trump is thinking of bombing Iran. You know why they're doing that? They're doing that because they've been calling Trump a warmonger for four years. Yet he has kept us out of war. And they know when Biden comes in, there's going to be wars popping up all over the world because he's not going to fight anybody on it. He's going to put our troops back into Syria. He's going to put our troops back into Afghanistan. And you know what with Afghanistan? If after 20 years, if them morons out there can't learn how to fight their own damn war, can't learn how to govern their own damn country, to hell with them. I don't want our troops out there. The only reason we went in is because they came here. And I want to remind you that the terrorist threat, Democrats and Republicans agree on this, uh, national security people around the world understand the threat of terror. And that is the reason we went into Afghanistan. I don't think we well, did it the right way. I, I, also, I also understand that Afghanistan is where empires go to die. You're right. Okay. I I can't argue with you on that, but we have to deal with the question of our own security in this country, and we'll see how it plays out. I'm not a prophet, but I can tell you that this is a growing problem, and it will continue to escalate, and uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. Well, but but lastly, before I get off, what really incenses me about the whole Trump deal is that people like you are willing to let our country go to hell because of your irrational hatred of Donald Trump and how he upset the status quo. I reject that. I've never irrationally hated Donald Trump. I disagree with his fundamental policies. I've never been critical of Donald Trump in terms of hate. I reject that, as you know, Don. Uh, I disagree with him on questions of choice, on the Supreme Court, on on questions of global warming. I disagree with him on innumerable issues. And in a true political discourse, you can disagree, as MZ pointed out earlier, agreeably. So that's why Trump people call my program. That's why I let them speak. And that's why I can publicly say when I disagree. That's I can say it before I take off. You do let Trump people get on. I invite Trump people to get on and and, and go at it with you. And and thanks a lot, MZ. Great show. Great. Don, uh, thank stay you. on the radio. Okay. Our next caller is going to be Amy in San Francisco, who has a question for John. Amy, you're on. Yes. Hi, John. Hi, Amy. Uh, hi. How are you, John? I, I'm so happy you are in the station. I, I mean the program. And uh, you. you are a very intelligent man, and uh, so I'd like to uh, discuss with you some issues. Please. I'm uh, that uh, silly girl I made the silly statement. I said that uh, Biden is the first American president made in China. So I made the statement. I, I think it's a you know, silly statement. But uh, I think I have uh, some kind of silly reasons to say that. Uh Please. Yeah, I was, I'm a Chinese by birth, American by choice. I've been in this country 38 years. And the reason I support Donald Trump is not because he is a Donald Trump, because his policy. And the main policy I support is to have this uh, policy to China. Since 1972, Nixon visiting China opened the door. And, also, of course, I'm this uh, policy is beneficial. That's why 
are able to come into the United States. Otherwise, I was dead for a long time ago in China. So I appreciate that. And I come in here for freedom. And I, because I, just my dream, to pursue my American dream, and to, um, I think that that's the place. And that uh, system is not perfect. It's, uh, it's the best in the world. And there's no other country can have it. Another place I will go. Okay, um, but uh, after year from year, and uh, I think that before the 2016, I gradually feel this country is shifting to a wrong direction, especially in the last 30 years, the policy with China, and that just make China um, become an awfully rich. Nothing wrong with that. China is my motherland, and uh, the country I'm from, I want the people over there to have a happy life, just like we have. Nothing wrong with that. The point is, the ruler of the China is a, still is a communist party. Um, since I come to the United States, I work very hard to pursue my American dream, so I become a real estate investor. So I was thinking I want to go back to invest in China. And then when I went back, uh, probably in 10 years of period, I just gradually, you know, discovered, and, uh, and there was the absolutely not the country they're doing things good for people. Actually, is somehow is worse than especially the current government and leader by uh, Xi Jinping. And uh, they are, you know, it's like a Russia oligarch. It, it, they translate the power and to the money. So they use the money to control the entire country. And the people is still very suppressed and, uh, and, and no freedom, especially no freedom of the speech. And right now, and then uh, after the globalization, and they have this our uh, tech company and uh, coming, and of course they provide a large market and for them to make a fortune. So they come into helping them and to censor people and uh, to control people actually worse than ever. So I just decided I'm not gonna do in business with them. So I took everything back. So when. Trump come out, that's the only president I see, only the policy they're talking about, they start a trade war with China. I say, finally, you know, uh, somebody do that. And somebody not a politician, because the rest of the party doesn't matter what party. They always say something, but they never do anything. You know, Republican or Democrat. And, uh, and Trump, uh, you know, I told a lot of people, 2016, lots of Republican people don't want to support the Trump. And they all say he's not a good guy, he's a phony, he's whatever. Even now, they're still saying that. And uh, But uh, I don't think uh, we try to elect the sin. We just want to elect the president can represent the American people's interests, not the bigger corporation's interests. So that's why I support him. And, uh, but now... You know, uh, this election also uh, from uh, China, from other countries, and the other things I know. And uh, they were uh, very smart in uh, stealing the election. Because as I know, lots of people, more people than 2016, and support the Trump. But I don't know why the outcome will come like that. So right now they're having a, a lawsuit and try to... Uh, and found out that what's the truth. So, uh, so basically, I know in this country, this legal system also could be bought, could be abused. An election system, same as that. So, I think it's not that simple, and uh, just a, like a choosing between Biden or um, Trump, or between Democrats or uh, Republicans between conservatives or liberals. It's not that. It's to choose our future of the, our country and choose the duration of the country. So we're going to head in a socialism or we still maintain our democracy and maintain our leadership in the free world. Because as I know, nobody can replace this point. And only China 
they have such a power and money and that they can replace. So that's what the war will be. We're going to lose everything. So that's what I try to say. That's what I'm saying is this, uh, this is the first three election I saw and how the China has used the power to control. Yeah, and so you have coined the term uh, first American president made in China. That's what I say. Uh-huh. Okay, so what's your question for John? <laughs> that was a great My question is, uh, my question is uh, I think I have a, a good conclusion, you know, that's from my experience. It's not for, uh, because a lot of people say, that, oh, you know, young people, they say, that, what thoughts do you come from? You are just listening to the brainwash by the uh, left, uh, rest, uh, the, you know, those uh, relatives and uh, those uh, uh, extremist uh, rights. You know, uh, I don't think I was being, I was being watched by China for a long, long time. 30 years I was there, you know. Real so quickly. I always independent the finger. I don't bring watched by anything. I just being my experience also, you know, my through my own thinking. I think everybody should not say, you, caught, you know, according to this source, according to that search, that, you know. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, again, Amy, do you have a specific yeah. question for John? And no, I'm just talking about that. John said, you probably John didn't know. You say that it's silly uh, thinking. So, you know, I just want to... So it was more of an explanation than a question. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Well, real quickly, uh, Amy's point about the first president being made in China with regards to Biden, and this, is, this gives me a question for John. And my question is... I can see her point with regards to that narrative because of the fact that I've made this sock argument before. You go to stores in the Rust Belt area where it's typically conservative, you can find ch a choice between socks that are made in the U.S. and made in China. Why is it that, like, you go to any of the stores out here in California, you can only find socks that are made in China, made in all these other countries, like, that are known for their poor labor laws, while pretending to be progressive and saying, oh, we pay our workers here a, a living wage, but we don't actually pay our suppliers, pay our manufacturers a living wage, and basically sell our guilt of that to other countries. Now, go to Walmart, uh, and you'll see uh, most things are made in China. Why? Because it's cheaper. And what do the American people want? They want a cheaper product. When Richard Nixon went to China in 1972, American business supported it because they thought we, that is the United States, would have a new market in China. Millions of people would buy American products. And it turns out what happened is because of China being able to produce products more cheaply, they, in fact, became the manufacturing center and we became the consumer. Now, it's a, it's a serious question, but we're never going to roll back the clock. It's not going to go back to the way it was. Uh, and uh, all I can say is it's a choice the American people have made. By the way, not that I want to be gratuitous in this, why do you think Donald Trump's ties were made in China? I mean, it was cheaper to make it in China. It's not necessarily a negative. It's the simple reality. You're in business, you want to make money. And if you can make something cheaper in China, you do it. That's why almost everything we wear, the shoes I'm wearing now, the pants I'm wearing now, the jacket I'm wearing now, all were made in China. Because you can't compete financially in this country. You can't do it. And w what do you feel would be a way to do that? By voting with our wallet and trying to get more people to buy American? Or would there be a way no, like... Manufacture in America. The American people will have to simply have to say, okay, we'll pay more. We want the products made in America. Look, what was the, where, is, the steel? Isn't that where Trump was, was leading? Isn't that where he was going? Yeah, and he failed. He never did it. He never did it. Uh, it's an illusion. What about People? Apple? What about when Apple moved uh, their production of Mac Pros to Texas? Well, uh, Texas, it's a lot cheaper place to produce than it is here. Uh, Texas is a right-to-work state, for heaven's sake. But take a look at the Bay Bridge. Where do we buy our steel? We didn't buy China. it from American steel companies. We bought it from China. That's exactly right. Why That's did we do it? It's cheaper. Don't you understand? It's part of the whole philosophy uh, that we've had in this country. It's not a bad philosophy. 
It simply means that our manufacturing base vanished. It, it just vanished because it was cheaper. And that was the argument, interestingly enough. So I say in 72, we thought it was going to work the other way around. They'd be buying American products. And it didn't work out that way because we have a minimum wage. We have a standard of living. We have labor unions. We have all of those things. And, and you know, you can say it's good, it's bad, it's indifferent, but that's the practical reality. It's cheaper in China, so you go to China. Fair enough. Okay. Gee, we have so many uh, emails to read and so many callers to get to. Let's, let's, I'll just do my best. Josh, thank you for, uh, and thank you, Amy. Uh, our next caller is going thank to you, be. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. A pleasure. Lisa, I, I'm so happy you are here so I can hear somebody uh, very intelligently and tell me and different opinions. You know, Thank you, that's Amy. That's why I it's supposed to be have a different uh, uh, opinions to can freely and talk to each other. That's America. Okay. All right. Here's our next. Uh, thank you, Amy. Here's Lou in Santa Cruz. Go ahead, Lou. You're on the air with uh, John Rothman and MZ. And even hey, Josh. Hey, glad here. you're on, John. Thanks, Thank to you, Lou. Hey. Okay. Uh, yeah. Glad you're on, John. Thanks yep. to uh, MZ, by the way. Uh, I don't listen all that often, but when I do, it's great. Sometimes. Have did it you on. ever think that being the case, uh, Lou? Did you ever? Did it ever occur to you that maybe you should listen more often? So it'll be great more often? <laughs> Weekends, they won't let me. I have to oh, take Oh, I see. Okay. It was hard to get through. But anyway, here we go. Uh, first it was, yeah! Recently, the best is yet to come. Oh, I gotta do that over it. The best is yet to come! Uh, reckless fools like uh, Trump and Bush Jr. spend us into oblivion. Putting off Green jobs, escalating the national debt, moving the atomic risk clock to seconds from midnight, and strapping generations to come with climate remediation and austerity to pay down the debt is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to irresponsibility. Obama rescued us from rampant terrorism and the worst Bush Jr. economy since the Great Depression, and that's only a start. Trump's infamy will take decades to completely unravel. Meanwhile, Democrats and other progressives will smugly resist quoting Limbaugh's I told you so, Miss Title. And follow it up with a Yahoo article about the poker game that uh, Trump is playing because he knows he'll be prosecuted for everything he got away with for the last four years. More than, in fact, every Democrat combined since the Dixiecrats took over the Republican Party. Uh, and they abandoned the Democrats. So I would have been a Republican back in the day, uh, following Lincoln's example. But now, of course, we shed our Dixiecrats, and we're Democrats. Okay. All righty, listen, thank you for calling. I appreciate it. Okay, here's Judy, who didn't swear and Hi. is ready. Hi, Hi. Judy. Hi. I don't know. You're on the air. Hi. Thank you. I really just want to say some stuff instead of talking to Mr. Rothman because uh, i just like to make some points for Donald Trump because Donald Trump is not. Hi. Okay. okay, well, wait okay, a second. Freedom we, of thought. We... There's not going to be any freedom of thought, let alone talk radio. If Don... Okay, if Joe Biden is not really the um, guy, he's just a front voice. I mean, the Democratic Party is barely alive. They're being funded. They were funded through Black Lives Matter and Antifa. I mean, okay, um, freedom. Okay, Donald, um, Joe Biden said about black people, like, back in 94, he, he called them predators. Okay, if um, so, the uh, crime bill that Donald Trump brought in was great. Donald Trump is for the we the people. He's not even barely a Republican. He was a Democrat at one time. I mean, he was asked to run for president by the White Hats because this country was almost being taken over by um, the deep state, combined with the Muslim Brotherhood, 
And um, now, right now, there are many arrests going on. There are people being taken to Gitmo. You may not believe this. People can go to Michael Jaco. Or, I mean, there's a lot of alternative sites that if I spit off, you might. But um, I wish we had more time for you. But we're in the we're in the uh, the the ending of the program here. Uh, Billy Sunshine, I think that's you. Is are you on now? Yes, I'm. Hi. I uh, always enjoy the program with Rock. So here's my question. And by the way, you need to do better call screening and not let those crazy people in. Uh, my question for you, John, is this. Uh, it's not about policy for me with Trump. It's about character and about the way he's destroying, as uh, uh, the previous caller would say, the deep state, which, of course, is just people who work for both Democrats and Republicans equally. Uh, what's going to be the end game? Is he going? To, he needs to. He needs a, um, a a pardon. Do you think he pardons himself? Is that constitutional, or does he let Pence get to be president for a couple of days and have, and, and get the pardon that way? Okay, let me answer you quickly. First, uh, a president theoretically has the power to pardon anybody, including himself. But I can assure you that if he did pardon himself, there would be court challenges. Remember, Bob Haldeman asked Richard Nixon to pardon all the Watergate people at the last minute. Nixon declined. Bill Clinton, in the midst of the Lewinsky scandal, said he would not pardon himself. But that would be a court challenge. Uh, the president is going to, uh, no doubt, face uh, indictment from the uh, New York District Attorney, Cy Vance. And Thank we'll God see for that. How it plays out. Let me say about Mike Pence. I, I don't know that the president would ever resign. <clears throat> I don't think it would help him to resign. If he wants to issue pardons, he can do it. Uh, and uh, Mike Pence has ambitions to be president of the United States one day. And he's tied to Donald Trump, but I don't think he'd go that far. I just don't see it. Um, but we'll see. You, you know, I'm not a prophet. Would, you don't think Pence would pardon Trump? Of course he would. He might pardon Trump, and he would use Gerald Ford as the... Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's model. what I was going to say. Yeah. Exactly. But remember that Mike Pence would only be president for a short time if that were to happen, which I think unlikely. And he has political ambition himself. Uh, and uh, so we'll see how it plays. I'm not a prophet. I can only tell you that uh, Pence wants to be president. I expect him to play an active role in the next presidential election. And we'll see what he decides to do. Billy, thanks for calling. Uh, here, wait a second. Here, our next caller Ed. is going to be uh, Sally in Pacific Grove. Sally, you're on the air. Hi, Hi Sally. Thanks for taking my call. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Well, I'll tell you. Um, I think it's ironic that everybody talks about Trump's poor response to the coronavirus, but but what he's never compared to is what the Democrats would have done. I mean, in uh, late January. Trump banned flights from China unless you were a U.S. citizen. And um, President, wait a minute, and Biden's Democrat decried Mr. Trump's order, saying it was hysterical and xenophobic and fear mongering. In late January, Mr. Biden's coronavirus advisor, Zeke Emanuel and Irwin Redliner, respectively, told CNBC viewers to take a deep breath, slow down. Stop panicking and being hysterical. On February 24th, Nancy Pelosi encouraged tourists to come down to San Francisco's Chinatown. And Dr. Emanuel told Wolf Blitzer that, that running out and getting a mask is not going to help. Who knows if he's wrong about that? The experts keep changing their minds about masks. And the other thing I read today just disappoints me terribly. In the Wall Street Journal is that the House has tabled the investigation of Brenner, Comey, Clapper, and the Clinton Foundation. No doubt, there was no doubt they tried to perform espionage. They tried to do a coup, a.k.a. treason. They tried to overrule over, uh, a duly elected president. And that's a fact. I mean, they did. They did do that. Let me, let me just say, because I know we're running out of time, I disagree with virtually every point you've made. Uh, I, I know, know you do, but I, one more thing is, he did, Trump did bring back millions of manufacturing jobs also, and Obama accused him of having a magic wand. Well, apparently he did. Okay, I, I just want you to know, it's, I, I treat your comments respectfully. If we had an hour, I would respond to each and every point. 
Uh, and I think what we have to do now is to recognize that we're beyond that. Joe Biden will be president of the United States on January 20th. We have to move forward. We've got a virus which is crippling this country, and we have to address it. And uh, now we'll see whether Joe Biden can begin to get a handle on this. Uh, so the partisanship should end. The election's over. And uh, Donald Trump lost and Joe Biden won. He got 80 million votes. Uh, Donald Trump got 72 million votes. Uh, and we just have to move forward. Uh, I, I, as I say, if I had time, I'd answer okay. every single point you raised. Well, we got a couple more calls here. Uh, Marcella and Salinas, you're on real quick. Hi, John. I want to challenge you when you claim that you're pro-choice. You're talking about pro-choice of murdering unborn babies. Oh, we, we, don't want to get into a, we don't want to get into a, a discussion of abortion now. Uh, Zoltan, you're on. Oh, Zoltan. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, okay, when, when uh, Mrs. Thatcher way back, okay, she said that the socialist system will collapse when the socialists uh, will run out of somebody else's money. When, when you look at the same thing you're looking at in China, the Chinese system is going to collapse when they're running out of stolen patent and stolen jobs, okay? Uh, so I'm not, I don't uh, disagree when they opened up China way back in the 72, but uh, unfortunately the politicians got corrupted. They never watched anything, you know, uh, 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 how much we ship there, how much they're buying through the balance of, you know, uh, the trade was completely on the side of China. So this is why they, you know, every time when China builds something, they actually, you know, take over certain parts of the economy. From country to country I go, I've been to over 100 countries. They just copy everything what they want to ship, you know, or copy and produce. Yeah, they can make it cheaper. Everything what they make, they make money. And this way, they also ruined our, you know, industry, uh, many of them. Uh, manufacturing industry so i'm very glad you know trump got back in and uh, and john for you don't worry trump's gonna be winning okay all all the uh, stolen votes and and uh, whatever is uh, uh, unconstitutional in many states will be re reversed in the supreme court just okay. just you know just hold your breath and uh, and we'll be going to the right direction okay and thanks for calling here's wendell and reno last caller of the day wendell you're on we only got a yeah minute. john i want John, I'd just like to ask you about the cabinet selections it looks like Biden's going to make. Um, they look to me very suspicious. Um, you know, lobbyists and corporate people, it looks like his cabinet's going to be full of uh, swamp creatures. What do you think? I, I have not I've not heard any names yet, but what you will see is a retread of people who served in the Obama administration. And because you view them that way, I mean, uh, it doesn't. We'll have to see how it plays. Uh, but I, I do not think they're swamp creatures. I think these are responsible people who will hopefully do a good job, and every president has the right to pick his own cabinet. And uh, I well, let's, certainly let's, believe let's that. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Let's keep our fingers crossed because one of the things I didn't like about the Trump administration is some of the people that he picked for his cabinet. Very questionable. Uh, Biden? Okay. Hey, we're, we're done, gang. I hate, hate to do this, oh, but that's the end of the show. John! Great Thank to have you on. MD, Hope to have you on again always soon. Always my pleasure. Okay, very good. Uh, see you all next week uh, as soon as I can hit.